Chapter 13 relates the account of David's desire to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. So perhaps we should start by asking what was the Ark of the Covenant and why was it so significant? About 400 years before the time of David, God had instructed Moses to construct this Ark. It was three foot nine inches long, two foot three inches high and two foot three inches wide. It was built to hold the Ten Commandments that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai, along with a jar of manna and Aaron's rod that budded. The Ark was completely covered with gold and was also known as the Mercy Seat. Some years before David became King of Israel, the Ark had been captured by the Philistine enemies of Israel, but they had then been afflicted with boils and tumours, so they sent the Ark back into Israeli territory. The Hebrews weren't then sure what to do with it, so for at least 40 years, and possibly more, it had been in the house of Abinadab, a Levite who lived in kiriath Jearim. It should have been at the centre of worship, so really it was symbolic of Israel's neglect of God that it was hidden away for so long in someone's home. God wants to be central to and visible through our lives in the way we live, speak and worship. So David gets everyone together and they agree that the ark should be brought back to Jerusalem, except no one consults God about the plan and how this should happen. You know, sometimes we want to do the right thing for all the right reasons, but we try to do it our way and it all goes pear-shaped because we haven't consulted God. And that's what happened here. They didn't check out the correct way of transporting the ark. And as a result, Uzziah, who was probably one of the sons of Abinadab and had been around the ark for years, lost his life. That seems a bit steep, doesn't it? I mean, Uzziah was only trying to stop the ark from falling off the cart, but the ark shouldn't have been on a cart in the first place. It should have been carried by Levites from a particular family. And Numbers chapter 4 verse 15 makes it clear that anyone touching any holy thing would die. So God just fulfilled his word. What do we learn from this? We can't live on good intentions, however well-meaning they may be. God calls us to live righteously and with holiness on his terms, not on our own terms. He makes the conditions, not us. We're called to obey him, so we need to spend time with him, listening to his instructions, and then we need to go out and do what he directs us to do. There is a good outcome from all of this, because David does his research and finds out the proper procedures, and then in chapter 15, the ark finally arrives in Jerusalem. But before we get there, there seems to be a bit of a hiatus in chapter 14, which begins by teaching us a little more about David. He was an influential and important figure beyond the borders of Israel. He wasn't just a man of war. He knew the importance of political alliances. He knew his relationship with God was vital if Israel was to flourish, but he was still a flawed human being. He had a weakness for women, which was then passed on to the next generation and led ultimately to idolatry in the nation. The second half of the chapter tells us about two successful battles fought against the Philistines. In both these instances, David consulted God before going into battle. God directed when and how David should fight, and because David obeyed, he was able to rout the enemy. Perhaps it was these two experiences that reminded David that we need to do things in the manner God directs us to do them, and not just in the way we think will please him. So, in chapter 15, we see that David has learned his lesson. He ensures that the Levites carry the ark into Jerusalem in the correct manner once they have purified themselves. This purification would have included washing their hands and feet, staying away from dead people for at least seven days, offering sacrifices for sin and putting on clean priestly garments. It may also have meant abstaining from sex temporarily. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 5, Paul alludes to abstention from sex for a season, to pray and to fast. Once everything and everyone was ready, priests, singers, musicians, people, there was a real carnival atmosphere. Such a celebration. Note that in verse 27, David dresses in a priestly garment. He was king, but he cast off the heavy royal robes so that he could join in with the dancing and rejoicing. He was not going to be half-hearted in his worship. And who got offended by this display of liberality? His wife, Michal, daughter of Saul. David and Michal had always had a bit of a rocky relationship. I mean, if your husband is on the run from your father for a decade, it doesn't really make for stability. Michal had initially helped David, but then Saul had given her to another husband, and then David negotiated to get her back, so she probably resented him already for uprooting her life once more. Whatever she felt, 
At this point, it is clear that she has no great love for God and doesn't understand David's passion. And so the ark comes to Jerusalem and we see that David wasn't just heavenly minded, he also cared about his people. He knew they would be hungry and so he provided food for them all. The meat from the peace offerings, along with the bread, dates and raisins, would have made a hearty feast at the end of the parade. But the celebration wasn't meant to be a one-day wonder. David now appoints musicians and singers so that there can be continual worship to God made before the Ark of the Covenant. David's Song of Praise in chapter 16 encourages us to seek God, giving a list of different ways that we can glorify him. It reminds us to remember his covenant, and Hebrews tells us we have a better covenant with better promises than those David knew. And it recognises that God alone saves, that only God is God, and that all creation joins in worship of his creator. God is good. But of course the story doesn't stop there. David becomes really concerned that he is living in a cedar palace while the Ark of God is in a tent. So, in chapter 17, he wants to build something special for God. What sort of dwelling are we building in our lives for God? Are we building him a palace? Or are we building a palace for ourselves, for our comfort, for our pride, for our ego, for materialism? David truly wanted to honour God, but God said no. Why? Chapter 22 verses 8 to 10 tells us the answer. David had been involved in too much bloodshed, too many wars, and God wanted a man of peace to build his dwelling place. But perhaps there is more to this than meets the eye. David was also a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. In this context, why wouldn't God allow him to build the temple? David was a man of war subduing the enemy. Jesus was also a man of war subduing the enemies of God. David wrestled against flesh and blood, Jesus wrestled against the principalities and powers of this dark world. David shed much blood. Jesus shed his blood. David was not permitted to build the temple of God until all battles were fought and won and there was peace. Jesus could not build the temple of God and 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 and 20 tell us that we are the temple of God until all battles with Satan were fought and won and he could establish peace. David was human, and so by the time peace was established, he was an old man, and thus Solomon was tasked by God with building the temple on earth. But David wanted to build something special for God. But God had even bigger plans for David. Verses 2 to 15 of 1 Chronicles chapter 17 show us that God was going to give honour, provision, inheritance, and an everlasting kingdom through the lineage of David. Reading verses 11 to 14 makes it clear that this isn't just about Solomon because Solomon wasn't going to live forever. And so these verses point us to Messiah, King Jesus. What's David's response to God? About eight times in verses 16 to 27, we see the phrase, your servant. His whole attitude was one of awe, reverence and humility. He didn't sulk and argue with God, he worshiped him. He was so overwhelmed by the favor of God in his life. I wonder how we react when God says no to us. Are we as humble as David, recognising the goodness of God in our lives? There is so much we can learn from David, and we'll learn more in our next session. <laughs>